Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Oh, wow. Welcome, 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 everyone. We are absolutely delighted that you chose to spend a little bit of time with us today. My name is Lisa Cunningham, and I'm here representing my BWHI team. A lot of you might know from what you just saw in our intro is that BWHI was founded 38 years ago, but it was founded by a black woman with some other amazing black women who was actually a part of the LGBTQ community. And that, of course, brings us to our event today. It is National Transgender HIV Testing Day. And we thought that this may be the best time for us to talk about health within the TGMB community. So I'm super excited because I've got some amazing panelists today. I want to first bring up Kaneen Matha. Kaneen is a Louisiana native. Afro-Indigenous female gender dormant queer artivist. And I love that term. She serves as a foundation and a bridge between multiple communities internationally. And she's a content creator who teaches the practice of physical and spiritual balance. Welcome, welcome, Kaneen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Excellent. Next up, we've got Dr. Tequila Manning. Dr. Manning practices family and social medicine. Her diverse history includes having conducted research in the areas of sex work, LGBTQ and government policy, and let's let her toot her horn because she has just completed her Master of Public Health from George Washington University. Welcome, Dr. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be in this space with you and deeply humbled. Thank you. Awesome. We, we are happy to have you. Next, we've got Octavia Lewis. Octavia is an activist, advocate, humanitarian, mother, and scholar, okay? And she is the transgender health coordinator for the Trans Wellness Center Montefiore, which specializes in a holistic approach to healthcare for TGNB people in the Bronx area and beyond. Hello, Octavia. Hello, and thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. And last but certainly not least is Amaya Scott. Amaya is a transgender actress, model, author, dancer, but a lot of you all probably know her as Miss Cotton on Lee Daniels' Fox drama Star. Amaya uses her voice to uplift transgender women of color and educate fans, fans everywhere about transgender people and issues. And that is actually why she is here with us today. Hello, Amaya. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, we are excited about all of this. You know, um, I, I was thinking about this particular event and I was thinking about how a lot of times when we have these webinars and different things, 
we 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 preaching to the choir. That's why I like to say we preaching to the choir. You know, it's like like minded people talking to each other. But what I like about this experience today is that I know how broad the Black Women's Health Imperative audiences are and all of the communities that we all serve. And I think that we are going to get a great group of people who will watch this today and beyond who can get some information that they just simply didn't know about, you know, this experience. And so I just want to get started. Um, but first, before we get into the more formal questions, I really want to do a temperature check because there's a lot going on, y'all. Just a lot. Seriously. Kaneen, tell me how you're doing today. Tell me what's going on with you. Um, managing, maintaining, you know, um, optimistic, but always alert and ever vigilant. <laughs> Oof, you said a mouthful just in that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Manning, how you doing? What's going on? So I'm in a transition phase in my life right now where I'm leaving, uh, graduating from residency and, and moving in to an attending physician job. Um, I am very nervous. I'm very excited. I am some days feeling very motivated and some days feeling not because of the things on the news and the things in our environment. But overall, I would say that I'm feeling very blessed um, to have friends and, and family and loved ones. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. Um, Miss Octavia, how you doing? Um, I, I, I guess I am learning how to live. Um, I've always been in existence um, or a mode of existence and never really lived. Um, and as a mother of uh, a brown and black um, young man, um, it is difficult at times, especially with everything that's going on in the media, everything going on in the news. So not only do I have to, you know, be cognizant and aware of how I show up in society, but also how they show up in society yeah. and, and making sure that I am raising them in a manner in which they will see women like myself and see me, see us for who we are and not what they have been taught. Um, so. Yeah, it's a lot, but I take it day by day, and I'm very thankful for that. Yes. Amaya, what you got? How you feeling? Temperature check. Well, I'm just I'm taking it day by day as well. I think that we're all kind of adjusting to a new normal. Um, I try not to focus on the negative. Of course, it's something new every day. Um, I'm trying to stand strong in my faith um, um, and hold my beliefs, you know, and just hope for better days. Hope for better days. Yeah. You said a mouthful with that one. That is what we can all do. And I think that's a good kickoff for our conversation too, is because better days um, for the community is that we have equity. That's what the reason why Black Women's Health Imperative is in existence is because every day we strive to bridge that gap of health equity in this country, and we know that that gap is far and wide. Um, Dr. Manning, um, no, you know what, um, Kaneen, um, as a transgender woman, do you think that healthcare has evolved to meet the needs of the community? Now, I actually know the answer, but I want you to tell us how and, 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 and why it, it probably hasn't. Well, as a transsexual being, because I, <laughs> uh, I would say that I think that healthcare is a reflection of the CDC, and the CDC is a component of the government, and the government has not evolved to meet the needs of the most poor, marginalized, and disenfranchised people. So with that being said, healthcare, they, they haven't even evolved to meet the needs of the poor. Mm. Mm. And our movement is, is we've been around, we've always been around, mm -hmm. but you know, society has recognized us for only a short time. And so 
I wouldn't think it was any way possible they could meet our needs, you know, although, you know, there are some valiant efforts, but we're, we're nowhere near, you know, sometimes I feel like we just need to throw the whole thing away and start over. Start from scratch. <laughs> Woo! Oh my goodness. Um, Octavia, what are your thoughts? Um, I kind of echo the sentiments of Kaneen, but working in healthcare, um, particularly with like-minded individuals, um, kind of make me optimistic. Okay. Um, I, you know, used to work a little bit closer with Dr. Manning um, when she first started her residency program. And being around other um, black women and black men um, that saw a need in our community and they saw, you know, us beyond our disparities. Okay. And I think that the way our health system is set up, it sees the disparities of people and not the humanity of people. Mm. And I think that until that paradigm changes, I really don't think that it can ever fully, you know, meet the needs of individuals because it does not recognize the individual. Um, so I think that that is something um, that I am optimistic it can change, especially with new leaders emerging like Dr. Manning and others that I have the privilege to work with. Um, but I know that not everyone, you know, has that level of, I'm going to say earned access to be in spaces and share spaces with, with other individuals that are trying to make a difference. And I don't think that that's highlighted enough um, that there are individuals on the ground that are trying to change the landscape. Yes. Now, it, it brings a good point um, to start talking to you, Amaya, because a part of what Octavia se seems to be saying is that they don't see us. They don't see us for our humanity because they also don't see us. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're helping to bridge that gap. Talk to me a little bit about that. Um, well, I'm trying to help, trying to assist. This is uh, much bigger than me. Um, I think that this journey and this fight has been going on long before me and will be going on long after me. And I think that the biggest thing to even use that in comparison, I know how privileged I am. I, I, I mean, I say that to say that I have issues. So I can only imagine what my sisters or my brothers go through with lesser assets or lesser connections. We understand that we mm. have such a long way to go. I think that that's the biggest thing. Yeah. No, I'm not satisfied. No, I am. I'm not happy. It's basic human care to think or be concerned about our um, like our safety, our privacy, people, people who know anything about us. It's exactly like Miss Octavia said, they don't even acknowledge us. So how would they have care specialized for us? Right. Yeah. I'm um, satisfied with it, you know, and I think that us speaking on it and um, having these conversations um, will like hopefully fan the fire to make a change because we are in desperate need for one. Yes, absolutely. So, 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 you know, that brings us up to the actual health care part of it. So in terms of, you know, your own personal health care stories, what do you prefer from a provider? I'll share this. I had to have a mammogram last year and I was terrified. I just get terrified doing certain things, right? Presenting how I present and going to the doctor. And I happened to end up having a good provider, this woman who could sense my uncomfortableness about the mammogram. And she walked me through this process and even told me, hey, you may get a follow-up call because of d dense breast tissue. All of this that she just watched, she made me feel okay. And I know that that's not everyone's experience when they go to the doctor. Um, and this was a, a cisgendered, you know, uh, tech that, that day. 
Tell me, Kaneen, what do you prefer um, when it comes to physicians? Do you prefer, you know, a, a, a male, a, you know, a woman? Who, who do you prefer um, on that side to, to provide your? So obviously, I think it's a um, it's a it's a case by case basis. But I also think for me, where I am in my journey for a long time, I preferred um, female p- physicians. Um, and one of the reasons why I can remember <clears throat> when I was going to have my orchiectomy before I had um, the sex change, I was they sent in a male doctor, and the male doctor was African American. Okay. So he looked at me and he was like, you know, that whole telepathic conversation was going on between us. But I'm sitting here. I've already started growing breasts. I've been living as a woman or embracing the path of my foremothers now for over 10 years. And the last thing I'm thinking about is performing as a man. Right. And he was like you know if you have this procedure, you'll never be able to perform as a man again. Mm. And I was so taken back by it. Mm. When he left out of the office, I said, can you send me a female doctor? Like I just, you know, and I was in a different place at that time. So I was very, I could get indignant real easy. (laughs) So like I stuck my head out the door and I became very indignant. I was like, can you send me a female doctor? Because I'm spending my money and I'm not going to have nobody questioning me about my existence and my choices at this point. So um, they sent in a female doctor, Dr. Janelle Foote, and she did my orchiectomy. Well, she overseed it. Um, And she was just totally understanding. Like she was giving me exactly the energy that I needed, you know. And throughout my health care, it's been predominantly, um, it's been predominantly females. But here recently, when I got to New York, I had, you know, one of my Caucasian sisters was my doctor. And she felt like she just knew everything. And she was giving me real Karen vibes. And I was like, this is not going to work. So now my doctor is an Asiatic um, man. And he is brilliant. Like, I love him. He, he listens to me. But I think it's about having that. You know, I, I, I'm also a very good advocator for myself and what I need. And I think in that area, I am privileged because I worked hard to be an advocate, not only for myself, but for those who are coming behind me. So when I go into an office, they know I will write letters, emails, yes. I will show up council meetings. I'm that kind of, you know, because I feel like we are not clients or patients. We should be partners in our health care because without us, you wouldn't be able to do what you do. So right. don't look at me as a specimen. Look at, we're partnering Ooh. in my health care. Partnering. Yeah. We need that. We need that message to get out to all women, period. Partnering in health. Because we don't think, we think that they're right. gods and gurus. And they, yeah. you know, they just tell now, us. My, my, what, one of my doctors told me one time, this was before I got ready to have my sex change. I kept going in there telling her I needed testosterone. This was another one of my Caucasian sisters. I go up in there, I go up in there, and I told her for like two years, I said, I need testosterone. I, I didn't know why I needed it, but I knew I needed okay. it. When I got ready to have my sex change, the doctor told me, your testosterone levels are so low that if I operate on you like this, you will bleed out on the table wow. and you will die. You will to death. But when I told her I needed testosterone, she told me, you're trying to be a woman. You're a woman. You're living your life as a woman. What do you need testosterone for? I'm not giving you that. Even women have testosterone in their body, sis. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So, so like, we, we know if we're paying attention, we have to begin to trust You know, these people that were like, if you're a physician, if you're a healthcare provider, you have to trust that people are in tune with their own bodies. I've been living in this girl almost 44 years. You would think I would know what was going on with my own body. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Octavia, tell me, what do you feel about the doctor and the type of doctor that you want? I'm not sure. Um, I actually have a woman of color doctor now. Okay. Um, she is excellent in every sense that 
when I go to her, we can have, you know, unfiltered conversation on sexual awareness, um, what that looks like, what body parts people use or do not use, and how to make sure that they are maintained. And I don't think that I've ever gotten that um, from any of my other doctors mm. uh, until I got her. And again, I am at a place where I don't have a problem with advocating, you know, for myself that, you know, I'm a sexual being. So like if I'm coming for STI checkup, I need to make sure that this throat gets swabbed. I need to make sure that this, you know, the shoe do and, and, this, and everything else gets swabbed because, you know, gonorrhea and chlamydia can hide down in that throat. Hello? So, you know, other doctors don't, you know, have those conversations and they, be, they get squeamish about that. And I'm just like, that, like, I want to know because I don't want to be walking around with a yuck throat, you know, or any other thing. Because again, as, as a sexual being, you know, I, I, I like to be sexual. So I want to make sure that all of my orifices are being changed yes. and that we can have that conversation and that you're not squeamish as well. Yes. Because if you're uncomfortable with me telling you about my body parts, how I use them and how I need them to be maintained, then I don't think that you are the person for me. Yes. And that is what I try to advocate, you know, to my sisters, whether, you know, they are phallic women, whether they are women that have went through, you know, their GRS, like make sure that you have that position that is comfortable with making sure that all of your body parts are maintained and that everything is checked up and everything, you know, is on the up and up. Um, so again, that's the way I am in my life. I don't have no, no, no moments where I'm, you know, uncomfortable with talking mm -hmm. about me because I want to live beyond what the statistics say we should live. Oh, yeah. And, and we need to make sure that we are in the best health that we can be because, yeah. you know, we suffer from breast cancer. Yep. You know, we, we, we suffer from, you know, heart disease and all, you know, different disparities. And I don't think that, again, people see us beyond, you know, our identity. All they think about is, oh, well, you just here for your hormones, sweetie? Right. Oh, sweetie, you know, like, what else is going on with you? Like, I have a whole lot of going on. I got heart, I got lungs. You know, I'm a big girl right now. So I'm in the process of having, you know, um, bariatric surgery. Like, okay. those are things in which I'm, you know, uh, again, making sure that we are having, you know, those conversations with and, and making sure that they know that like we need to 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 be able to utilize these services yeah. so yeah that's all the I mean. comments i see the comments coming in and and uh mblb said no lies detected um facts octavia teach jasmine said so people are definitely um uh, loving everything that you all are saying right now amaya tell me about what you want um and who you feel most comfortable with from your doctor um, so I think that I would feel most comfortable with the decent human being first. Oh. Not that to whereas um, uh, like their gender really doesn't matter to me. I mean, I feel like that's a personal preference. I personally may want a female doctor, but they can be male. They can be of color. They can be be a good person, yeah. uh, like have a good heart. I think that is vulnerable for anyone to go into a hospital. So that's the thing that sometimes we miss. People, everyday people going into hospitals is somewhat of an uncomfortable situation. So then you layer trans into that and that just heightens that whole experience. Um, uh, like I personally have been in the hospital sometimes and I, I have almost felt like an experiment, you know? Um, I mean, that's not a good feeling when I'm there to receive assistance, when I'm there for help, when I'm there for healing, when, I mean, like, come on, you know? Um, I would like to have someone who knows my body and knows the anatomy and uh, um, just like Octavia said, who is comfortable or who makes me feel comfortable. Of course, it should be a collaboration, but I'm here for your help. Right, right. So, you know what I mean? Don't ask me. I'm like, I didn't go to medical school. Does that make sense? Of course. Yeah. Wow, this is a good segue for you, Dr. Manning, because you wow. heard all of this input, right? Wow, so, yeah. <laughs> so as a physician, first of all, do you think that you were giving, given adequate training to provide 
competent health care to the uh, TGMB community? Yeah, so the short answer to that question is no. I was given hardly any formal training in medical school about um, LGBTQ health, trans health, non-binary health, like um, really not much of that. So we had, um, my med school was set up on like a module system. So you go through your different modules. And um, the times that I remember any of these health topics coming up were basically during reproduction or psychology or endocrine, where they tell you how to diagnose, treat and diagnose gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. And that's like mainly saying like, oh, someone comes in with these complaints, you can send them to psych and endo, which isn't like a comprehensive training and is also not like a very formal um, uh, thing to say. So in fact, um, in medical school, I sought out, um, a fellowship, a trans health fellowship, where I spent a year at the Transgender um, Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. So this was by my choice. So I, mm -hmm. I, I applied for a scholarship grant for uh, to study a health topic of my interest, and I, I used the, I did that with that opportunity, and okay. so I went to the Transgender Institute for a year and my goals there, um, there's psychologists working there who does a lot of um, trans health and then get, does referrals to physicians and surgeons throughout the community and tries to facilitate that process. The issue was it was very unorganized and not a, like a, and a heavy burden on the actual client, on the person you're trying to help. Mm. So, you know, all these handwritten forms and letters and referrals. So one of the things my project did was create an electronic health record yes. for um, her practice so that you know you can talk to the physicians directly through this you can you don't have to send all these papers and referrals with the client you know across town um you can facilitate a lot of this because we know that one of the biggest hurdles is actually getting to the doc getting through the front desk at the doctor's office um other things i did during this process was figure out what are the needs of the population what are the needs of the community and one of the things that i thought um that the H the emr was really helpful with is that it helps you you can put in pronouns you can put in preferred name mm -hmm. um very electronic um also one of the things that we found is that her office was just all this handwritten stuff. So there were attempts, people trying to break in into the institution to, you know, take people's personal health information. Wow. So just like really not secure. So helping to like kind of facilitate that process. Other things, um, I did research in Costa Rica. So a lot of you brought up about how you're just not heard, you're just totally overlooked. And I agree with that. I did research on sex work and government regulation in Costa Rica. And I had this really nicely put out survey that was approved by the Institutional Review Board. And I was very proud of it. So I go to Costa Rica to interview all these sex workers and they're happy to, to work with me, but they just can't get past the first question which is, and I feel really bad about this, but this is then and, and here we are now, of me asking people, you know, what is your sex? Or, you know, and people being like, you only have male and female here. Oh. So people being like, you know, Dr. Man, you know, we're happy to help you. We're happy to participate in your study, but what is this about? Right. And so that also brings to the point that other, um, many of you mentioned about you having to teach your doctor, <laughs> you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I find very interesting in that whole research project, I had spent almost a year planning this research project. The thought never even crossed my mind. Right, and right. I am horrified by that truth. And then even more horrified that my advisor on the project did that didn't even cross their mind. <laughs> so it's like, you're sending me to do this research and we haven't really, we've like totally neglected a whole population of folks. Um, that a sex work it like affects and and government regulation affects so i revised and i had great outcomes but i just think that was like a very teachable moment for me mm -hmm. um and so overall um no i have received more education from members of the tgmb community than my medical profession wow it's it's got to change i mean we know we all know that and then sometimes don't you all think that it starts at the top and so the top meaning, who thinks that the current, so I know we just had the shift. And the one thing that made me, I, I, it almost literally brought tears 
of joy to my eyes is that when it was Transgender Day of Visibility, the president posted it on his social media page. And I was just blown away by that. So blown away that I was in the barbershop in Atlanta and, you know, it's one of those, bar it's a barbershop, you know? And so I heard this brother and this brother was like, yeah, I saw, I saw the president post something about this trans stuff. You know, you know, they bought the election for them just like they bought Obama's election. You know, I had to hear this in the barbershop but I was, I was happy. I was like, eh, because we know what the last four years did, right? So do you all think that this current administration is going to do enough to protect the TGMB community? I'm going to start with you, Octavian. Um, personally, no. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I say no is because executive orders are not laws. And that was the same thing in which Obama did for us. And people were ecstatic. People were jumping for joy. And even I jumped for joy a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I, I, I got excited, too, until the until 45 came in mm. and showed us exactly what they can do with executive orders. OK. Um, so when I, you know, see them go to the point of, you know, creating laws like with the, um, I think it's the equity law, equitable law that's, that's now. Yeah, um, the Equality Act. The, yeah. the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm I'm excited, you know, to see what that is going to bring right. for the community. Um, but in that, I know I have not taken my due diligence to read all of that because oftentimes, you know, we, we look at things and what people tell us and oftentimes we are left out of the mix. Yeah. Um, when when they got, you know, when marriage equality passed, you know, we were thinking that a lot of the organizations were going to continue doing the work to make sure that, you know, people of TGMB experience were protected, too. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those organizations, they closed up shop. Right. Okay. And we were, we were left, again, you know, without the protections that we needed. But we were the main ones that were packing the buses, going down to D.C., rallying, putting our life on the line, you know, being on the front line. But yet when it was all said and done, we, you know, we packed up, we went back home. And here we are where we still don't have equal protection in all the states, you know, for people of trans experience. And even my experience, you know, being here in New York City um, before, you know, they passed, you know, legislation here for us was that when we used to go up to Albany to rally, it was like us getting on the Underground Railroad. Wow. Because the bus would only stop in two places with us. Um, and that was in Newburgh and it was another um, city because those cities um, had ordinance on the book where they protected you know, people of trans experience um, against discrimination. But other than that, the bus would not stop with us anywhere else besides those two locations when we wow. were on our way going to Albany. And, you know, people, you know, looking like, oh, New York is so progressive. But during that time, which it wasn't, wasn't that long ago, it wasn't as progressive as people thought because people look at New York City and think, oh, well, that's it. That's yeah. That's it. And that's not, you know, and that's not, you know, completely accurate. Um, and I think that, again, as far as the current administration goes, no, I, I, I know, you know, they have three more years. Right. And a lot can come out of those three years, but I won't put on my party hat and my party dress and start, you know, cranking up the tunes until I see some laws enacted on the books. Yeah. Amaya, I saw that hand. I saw that. So tell me, do you agree with that to, to, to some degree or to all degree? Yeah, I mean, completely. I think that the idea, like, I think that this support, um, like, of course, we, uh, we love that, but it's about action. Um, it's not about the post or shining certain color lights on the White House or anything. Like our sisters are dying. Our sisters do not have the means that they need. We need action. It's no different than painting crosswalks when they're killing our black men. And I know that that's a different conversation, but do you understand that it's like, though there's nothing wrong with those things, we still need action with it. Absolutely. I know you want to say something, Kanine. Unmute yourself. 
So, um, you know, I have a very non-traditional approach when it comes to the whole voting process. Well, I'm not going to say non-traditional because it's not non-traditional amongst Black people, but it's very unpopular amongst people who still see hope in the system. Um, For me personally, I think I have a very much... I come from the boots. I come from Louisiana, and I look at it as you can't miss what you never had. I've never felt protected by the government. I've never felt like the government was there for me. I've always felt like I had to kind of like make things happen for myself. I've I've had to rely on the seeds that I've sown, the things that I've done, the community that I've built in order to feel safe and protected. So that pretty much has not changed for me. Um, I thought that the last administration was actually necessary because it showed us the reality. A lot of people didn't want to look at it, but it showed us what it was really hitting for. So, you know, we really saw it was mask off, you know, so mask on now, but it was mask off. Like, so I am a person who appreciates the bitter and the sweet in life because I understand that chaos and order make wholeness and balance. Mm. And so the season of chaos was definitely necessary and it woke some people up. You know, people started realizing um, that, hey, something's got to change. And I was very excited about the whole, because I was a part of the movement when the word transgender started to be pushed to the forefront. And, you know, at that, before that, we were using the word transsexual because it was assumed that every girl who was having, you know, who was on this journey was going to get a sex change. But we realized that, hey, this term does not fit everyone. Mm -hmm. And so they created transgender But my problem with the term transgender is that I feel like it, I feel like a lot of times girls who look like me, and when I say me, I mean brown, I mean dark, we were this when we were young. We did not live as males for 40 years, establishing all kind of power and things behind our name and then say, oh, I'm a woman now. You know, mm-hmm. since 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 the pendulum is shifting towards women being in power and it's unavoidable. OK, I want to be a woman now and absorb some of that. And I'm not saying that all of them are doing this. I'm just saying that I've seen examples of that. And so mm-hmm. meanwhile, girls who look like me been out here struggling, been out here dying, been out here being statistics, been out here being used and abused by this system. All for us to get chunked under this word that we never were because Mm. I've always been what I am. Mm. You know, I've always been, even when I was a child, I leaned more to the feminine. I was female gender dominant. I've always expressed, I feel like for me, this was an evolution, but I accepted the term transgender because I wanted progress. So when we talk about the government being able to be there for us, that will require them to understand and actually know apples from oranges, yeah. like who, who we are, like understanding your population and who it is that you're serving. And I think right now there's so much confusion around that. It's hard for them to give us the help we need because they're too, it's like the only ones of us who will be able to get the help are the ones who are willing to assimilate into this to this narrative and everyone's not going to be able to do that. And we see that time and time again. And those are the ones that we're finding that are, that are, that are not surviving and that, and that are being targeted because we just can't, we can't perform what we're being expected to perform in this, in this reality. Right. Right. So, so it seems like also to, to you. So if we take, if we take politics out of it, if we take the administration out of it, what does it go back to, Dr. Manning? <laughs> Our actual providers. 
That's what it seems mm -hmm. like. It has to keep going back to the providers because we know that you all can exist outside in a sense of the administration and create um, systems and processes that make sense. What, what, when I say, what is trans affirming care to you? What does that mean? And what, what do you think some of the best practices are in that, in that space, Dr. Manning? Gosh, I've got so much to say. So when we think about affirm gender in terms of like what that term means in the medical literature, it is when one's gender identity is validated by others as authentic. Okay, so let's kind of get into this. So I actually recently had a, a practice question on a on a practice test for my boards about this very thing. And it was like a patient comes to your clinic and they say that they um, want hormone therapy. What do you do? And so the correct answer is, well, you assist them. <laughs> OK, um, this is this is basically affirming one's gender and providing health care accordingly. In my mind, trans affirming care is just basically basic medical care for a population like with any population. So as physicians, we're taught that we assess patient needs and we go from there. And so that, so I know like, um, like someone was mentioning, we have to give it a term transgender or trans health or whatever, but at the end of the day, what it really is, is it's about health justice. It's about meeting people where they are. And we are taught this all throughout medical school. So this isn't a new area of healthcare. This isn't like recreating the will. This is, this is just providing basic health care to, to people. So when we think about what are some best practices for providers? Well, there are a lot of things to think about here. So we know that providing care to this population is multidimensional. OK, is not just about uh, prov about the care It's about the approach also to care. And many of you have have noted that as well. So some of the things to think about is being open, listening to patients. Yes. OK, being honest about your own implicit bias. Mm. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what physicians can do, what we can do as a team, and what we can do in the medical environment, in the medical community. So one of the things on a personal note is to address your own implicit bias. For example, I was born and raised in the state of Mississippi. Okay, so I grew up in a very transphobic, homophobic environment. Okay, I did not um, interact with LGBTQ community folks until I went off to college. I had to go to a small liberal arts college in the middle of Iowa to, to engage with the community and to learn what is LGBTQ. And I, and I think that that um, also paints a picture that we've got to all know that people are raised in different environments and, and no one can help that, okay? But people can change and grow, okay? So th that's one thing I think is very important. Another thing is apologize, apologize, apologize. We need to approach every patient interaction with awareness and sensitivity. I admit freely that I'm flawed and I'm gonna make mistakes, okay? And I'm gonna talk about some of those mistakes later. But I think it is, it is very important to know that when people come to your office, like someone said, do your own research, okay? <laughs> there was a, a study that showed that 24% of trans folks have to teach their physician what to do. That's nonsense, okay? When, when any patient comes to my office, I, yes, I look for them to tell me their symptoms, their story, ask questions, but I don't look for them to say, oh, you need to order testosterone today, or you need to order, like, I don't look for people to tell me how to manage their health care. <laughs> okay. So do your own research. There's so many resources out there. Callan Lord has a whole practice, medical practice guideline to help physicians and guide physicians. There are resources out there. There's the National Institute of Transgender Equity. Like there's things there that can guide you. I'm gonna inter inter interrupt and I want you to keep talking, but the Black Women's Health Imperative has the affirmative care. Oh, you went out a little. Yeah, you can't hear the rest of it. Oh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's the affirmative care for Black women of transgender experience providers guide. It's over 35 pages. It's very robust. It sits on our um, website. There we go. 
Um, it sits on our website. Um, and Joe, um, if you can put that as a ticker on the bottom as well. Um, and, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's just, it addresses everything that you're saying um, here. So I want you to keep talking, but I just would have been remiss if we did not talk Thank about. You yeah. So much for sharing this. Thank you so much for sharing this. And so, you know, there's like, so this is a great example of a, a resource tool. I found several. Okay. There's so many. And then there's the healthy people, 2030 objectives for the population. So clinicians, there's, there's things that you can do. Other things to really think about um, is language. Okay, terms, pronouns do matter. They absolutely matter. Okay, everyone on staff has to be aware from the front desk staff to the nursing staff to the physician to the ancillary folk. Like, it can't just be one person or a handful of providers in a clinic who's for the cause. Like, everybody's got to be for the cause. Like, we've all got to be working on this together as a team. And it has to be an organizational, institutional approach. Right. So yes, when you yes, come yes. to my clinic, to my facility, which I'm sure took so much effort for you to get there. OK, mm -hmm. what do you see when you arrive? Do you see trans friendly environment? Do you see signage, postage, things that show that this is a safe space and that you're welcome here? How are you greeted at the front desk? How did they refer to you when you were greeted? OK, I've had I've I had a situation, honestly, just two weeks ago, a patient of how they were they were encountered at the front desk, you know, asking people about their gender. And, you know, my patient was so taken aback because she was like, first of all, I didn't give anyone permission to put that in this in the in the mm. banner on my name. So, you know, we have tools. The electronic medical record is great. We have tools, but we have to have conversation with folks. We have to get permission <laughs> to, to write things and to do things and to, to use certain pronouns. We can't just do things without permission. And so she was understandably upset. OK, like she came here not looking for that today. And so before she's even interacted with me, she's already been insulted. Right. Right. Okay, so we we everyone needs to be trained. We've all got to be all hands on deck here. Um, and then for providers specifically, we've got to think about when we are in the actual encounter. Okay, you are taking a medical history like you're taking a medical history with like any other yeah, patient. Else. Someone has stated, "Why are we just talking about my genitals?" Right. Okay. We don't need to. You know, I had a physician ask me, "Did you do a genital exam?" And I ask, no, why? I mean, was that that's not even indicated today? So you know, the med, you know, there's a patient in front of me who's coming. They, I'm going to talk about all of your medical issues. Like, are you at risk for diabetes, hyper, right. like everything that I would do with anyone else? And I'm going to take a thorough sexual history, okay? Like I would do with anyone else. But I'm not going to ask to see your genitals just right. because you told me you were transgender. That doesn't make any sense. So when we think about physical exam, we think about sensitivity. Okay. This is a stepwise approach. I do things that I'm given permission to do. Okay. I do things that are medically indicated mm -hmm. and necessary, okay? Um, and I explain why I need to do it, what, what I'm doing, why I need to do it, and what the information is gonna be used for. I do that with everybody. These are actually basic principles of medicine. Everything I've just stated, this isn't very specific to the transgender health. OK, so this is these are things that they teach us in medical school and they and they shouldn't be any different. And then other best practices, I think, is being a community advocate. Yeah. OK, don't it's not just in this room together yeah. that we're spending time. I'm out in the community. I'm talking to family and friends. I'm correcting people when they say things that are incorrect. Mm -hmm. Mm. or insensitive or not politically correct. You may feel that way, but maybe you should think about why you feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh. Doctor, that was so much to digest. And I'm, that's why I'm glad that programs like this will live on because they're, you know, I, I just tell anybody, share this with your networks after this event is over with because you just said a whole mouthful that a lot of providers need to know. And then also just for red flags for people to know of what isn't right. And so you can advocate as both Octavia and um, Kaneen said for yourself. Um, now, the reason for the season that we are here today is because it is National Transgender HIV Testing Day. 
do you feel like this day, do you feel like days like this have become like a check of the box? Do you feel like anybody, um, how can we make this these types of days more impactful? Um, do you feel like anybody, the, the, the whole HIV, like the light is even on this topic anymore? And what can we do to kind of get people to thinking about it again? Kaneen, talk to me. Yeah, um, so I, it was kind of going in and out a little bit when oh, you were saying a little piece. So I'm just going to kind of guess. Sure. <laughs> but um, National I, HIV I, Test, Transgender HIV Testing Day. Can you hear me now better? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay. Um, so the community, like, like how can we get people more interested in testing? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I have a whole lot of thoughts around that, but I feel like our health is important. Um, I feel like conversations like these, you know, raise the raise the conversation. Um, I've been a person who has who started getting tested when I was fourteen years old. And um, I've developed my own relationship mm. with what I like to call the nothingness, because that's what I call HIV, and because it stopped nothing. So um, yes. I I started taking tests when I was fourteen years old, and I was encouraged to take the test because of the lifestyle, and I took them every six months all the way up until the moment that I was diagnosed with the nothingness when I turned 26 years old. Okay. And um, I knew immediately, like I had literally like took two tests that year that came back negative. And then the next one came back positive. So um, I think it's very important to know what is going on with yourself so that you can manage whatever dis-ease that is manifesting within your vessel early, you know, so that you don't have to go through a lot of the physical yeah. issues and challenges that a lot of people make. So whatever, whatever is going to be your lot, like however the dice are going to roll, I think it's important for you to be in charge and to be active and to make to make and take those steps to be present for your own health you yeah. know like that's what i would say so i think you know conversations like this are definitely important and i just think that it is important that we do what we can do to to make sure we know what's going on with us so yeah. we can know what we need to be our best selves Amaya, talk to me. Do you feel like um, that this, uh, the topic of HIV and National Transgender HIV Testing Day, do you feel like people care? Um, well, yes, of course people care, but I think it's about us destigmatizing HIV. Okay. Um, I think it's about us like having casual conversations about it. We don't, um, like especially in 2021, I mean, Though it is a disease, I believe that we've come so far. So I think for us to talk about it normally, not like it's a life sentence, just as Kaneen said, it's nothing. I mean, and it is something. Right. Then what I'm saying, it doesn't define you or your life or what you can accomplish or what you can do. I think that we need to be comfortable in having these conversations. It's not um, taboo. Uh, something that's a secret or something that we have to whisper about, like, we need to talk about it, like, outright. Outright, outright. Octavia, what you got? Um, yes, I, I, I do find the importance of um, this day, um, especially with how um, it impacts our community. Um, but one thing I, I you know, kind of have to, like, give a little pushback on is I don't want it to people that use it to pathologize our community uh, and mm. overdo it. Because sometimes, you know, if which I don't go anymore, but when I was going to the club with my friends, 
I didn't want to see that van out in front of the club. I'm like, come on and get HIV tested. I'm trying to party. So I don't want to get no bad news when I'm trying to party. And, and you know what I'm saying? Be with my friends. So I, I, I just felt like sometimes, you know, we overdid it. And we didn't allow us, you know, to be human. We didn't allow us to, you know, get our drink on, eat our chicken wings, you know, right. pop off in our mouth when we was in the club. You know, probably because all you thought about was, oh, well, that's that crowd, girl. They, they, got, they got that over there, so we got to go and get that band over there and get them all tested, which that is fine to do. But at the same time, we're human. Yes. We want to enjoy ourselves. We want to live. We want to commune. And like I say, in every space that we're in, we don't want to talk about HIV. Yes. Um, and I think that it's times and places for that. When I'm with my doctor, yes. Like this national day that's happening, yes. Right. But not when I'm trying to party with my friends. Right. My okay. Friends on my party on. Like that's why I have to give a little pushback from. Uh, Kenine, I know you want to say something. Yes. I just wanted to say this right because she, because that was that was like she articulated so well. My feelings, because sometimes I think that there's a psychosis that happens mm. and we we start to manifest certain things just because it's being so pushed on us. Some people, when they're under pressure, they make more mistakes. Like some people, pressure makes them do better. Pressure is like, you know, it forges them, it makes them stronger. But for some people, they fall apart. And so when something is being just drilled down, you know, sometimes it makes us do things. Like, for example, when I was younger, I was told constantly I was going to hell for my lifestyle. Right. So I was like, why do I need to use a condom? Why do I'm, I'm going to die anyway? I'm going to hell anyway. So it made me more reckless. You know, it made me more careless because of this constant narrative that I was going to hell. So when we, when, when HIV becomes synonymous with us, it's like, girl, you could get HIV, okay. Like, I don't want to normalize me getting HIV. Mm. I, want, I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want that to be, I don't want to be, oh, girl, you trans, girl, we know that's a reality. Like, mm. this shit. It shouldn't be like that. So, you know, where Octavia is talking about the pushback, that's where I have the pushback at. And that's why I don't call it that. That's why I made my own language to talk about it. Because I don't want to speak that over anyone's life. I want them to be aware and I want them to be present, but I'm not trying to in indoctrinate or inundate them with that until it just because everybody's mind is not as strong. Yeah. Yeah. You're bringing up a good point. That's a good segue to our next question, which is and more Lisa, about before you, And before you, you, yes, I just want to take this oh, question. Sure. Take it. Before you um, go to your next question, I just want to, you know, thank the Black Women's Health Imperative um, for specifically getting three diverse trans women, yes. meaning that all of us are doing different things, even though we identify a certain way. I think that is something that is not always highlighted in panels with trans women. And the fact that you have someone that is an archivist that is doing things against the grain and that you have someone that is in the professional limelight that is a professional and, and can show that we can do what other people do in a professional spotlight. I appreciate that and showing that we also have trans women that are working in the health field um, and then that we can be multifaceted. So that is, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I put that plug yes. in because we don't have panels that show our diversity yes. and show that we can be multifaceted and that we can do many things upon the, you know, being who we are. Well, thank you so much for that, Octavia. And I know she's listening. Nakisha Powell is our program manager. And we just, we take all of the space involving all women so seriously. And that's the broad spectrum of how we, the lens that we always operate from. And, and, and it's going to take that approach um, to, to, to turn this thing around, so to speak. Um, I love what you were saying, Kaneen, um, and, and that actually goes back to our question about 
Can anybody share an experience that is considered a teachable moment? Octavia, because you were talking about a teachable moment is to say, hey, you all, don't show up with the bus at the club. You know, <laughs> that, might, that might not be. But with regards to our health in general, who, who can give me, um, Dr. Tequila, can you give me a teachable moment um, that you can think of? Yes, I can give two, actually. Okay. Um, so I was trying to establish a, a small practice um, at my clinic, and I had a couple of patients who were coming for hormone therapy and was very excited about that because, you know, this is how we grow as physicians. We learn from our patients. We learn by the what's new in the times, you know. So um, I was very excited about this. And so I had one encounter um which I kind of alluded to previously about um, I had a nurse who was I was working with who was refusing to refer to my patient by their correct pronouns. And it's like, after you have a conversation, what do you do with that? If it, that continues and you feel like it's intentional and we know what country we live in. OK, we all watch the news. We know that America is so many isms. Okay. Um, and so it's like, so th there was, that was one moment. And then another incident where I had a patient who received notification that we no longer accept their insurance, which is just not true. And had been having complications at the front desk, checking into appointments anyway, before this had even happened. And so it's, my teaching moments from these two incidences are after I have my meetings with my supervisors about what went wrong, then what? Uh, what next? Okay. How do we grow? Where do we go from there? How do we simply move past we messed up? I'm sure y'all are tired of hearing that right, from right. doctors. Okay. I know I'm tired of saying it. You know, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I messed up or we messed up or I apologize for my staff or whatever. When do we say, okay, that's that's done. Okay. We're tired of talking about we messed up. Where do we say, how do we hold people accountable for their actions? Okay. This is a health profession. Okay. This is, you come to my clinic, this is a professional environment and that is discrimination. Okay. So how do we hold people accountable? How do we train and educate professionals? What do we do with medical education starting this early? Some medical schools are changing and incorporating more and more in this into the curriculum, but like, how do we make for real systemic changes and how do we repair broken relationships? Mm. Those are two broken relationships I have right now. How do I go about repairing those? Um, and so I think we need the teachable moments. There are a lot in those, right? There's a lot of some of the stuff I had even talked about in terms of best practices, okay? So, and it's like, okay, so how do we not be gatekeepers of hormone therapy? How do we treat people with respect? How do we make people feel safe? Um, and when things, when we, when there are errors, where do we go from there? H what's the accountability? What are the protocols that we're abiding by? What are our institutional policies? What is our mission? Okay, is this yeah. part of our mission? Yeah. <laughs> you know, is this part of our vision as a as a as a health profession as a even as an individual clinic is this part of our identity we are a community it, we are a clinic in this community that serves this population and this is what our values are right yeah. where are those explicitly stated um amaya any any teachable moments and and i want to also dr manning started bringing up something that made me think about even our our next question as it relates to dealing with our cisgendered sisters. So have you had any t teachable moments that relate to, um, to them? Um, so every day is a teachable moment, to be completely honest. Um, but, but I think that the biggest thing is that people who are willing um, to learn, but I do want to kind of cut in that to say that we aren't teachers either. Mm. It's not our place or point to educate. Now, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I don't, but I feel like you understand what I'm saying. So oh, yeah. many were asked to teach and to share, and I think that it rides the fine line of go read a book or like <laughs> or we'll figure it out i mean i have no problems talking about the basics but you understand what i'm saying i think mm -hmm. 
vulnerable moment is to gain that knowledge on your own. Stop expecting trans people to uh, to divulge and to, you know what I mean? Crack ourselves open to just spill everything else. Uh, like, I, like, it's nothing wrong with sharing, but I think that that's uh, the main thing. Teach yeah. yourself. Yeah. And we all experience that because even during what we've been dealing with, with the racial unjust, is unrest, it's the same exact thing. They expect us to educate them on everything. We're tired. We're victimized every day. And now you want us to tell you how to deal with it, you know? You um, understand what I mean, but I also think that another teachable moment is just respect. I think invasive questions definitely need to stop. Um, like questions about our bodies and things like that that have nothing to do with situations. And I think that that's something that happens frequently. Sometimes it's maliciously, sometimes it isn't. But my private areas are none of your concern and should have nothing to do with us personally getting to know each other. Do you know, like um, it's just decent kind of respect and human decency. You don't uh, like go around and ask someone about their private parts. So I think that trans people are also, we should be treated with the same respect. You understand what I mean? Just because things may be different or just because things may be interesting to you. Again, it's about boundaries. I think that that matters. Octavia, you want to chime in a little? Um, I know you said something with regard to our cis um, women yeah. or cis sisters. Um, I just want to let people know, it's, it's not a competition for me. Okay. Because we're not looking for the same thing. We're not, I, we never sat down and say, oh girl, we're competing for this. So I don't even compete with myself because that means somebody got to lose and I don't lost enough. So I don't do no competition. Whoever, it, 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 whatever you got going on, that's for you. And what I also tell women is these same no good Johnnies that pop and beat on you be the same ones trying to pop and beat on us and my sisters. So we mm. do have a lot of those intersectionalities and those things that are common when we are dealing with insecure men who, you know, are not secure with whatever it is that they're going through. The same way they're going to treat you be the same way they try to treat us until we get that hammer. So, you know, I, I, I'm just saying, you know, I, we just got to realize we ain't all, you know, going to get to the same place at the same time. And that's OK. But while we're on this journey, there is no need for the disrespect. There is no need for us to get out of pocket or, be, you know, misalign with one another, um, because that's one thing I'm not going to do. As a woman, and yes, I say as a woman of trans experience, I'm not going to get out of line with another woman unless you take me there. Because I come from a black woman and I have a black sister. So like I respect them just like they respect me, but it, it is earned and it is given. So don't think that you're just going to, you know what I'm saying, give me, you know, your mistreatment. Because what I always tell people is that, you know, your public, um, how is it? your public discomfort does not equate to my private disdain. Mm -hmm. Meaning just because you're mm -hmm. uncomfortable does not mean that I have to sit with that. That's something that you have to wrestle with. And I'm not taking that on because I already have enough stuff on my plate and enough stuff that I have to live with and deal with. And I'm not taking on anyone else's. Now, we're going to do this together amicably, respectfully, and we, you know, realize that our liberation is entwined with one another and we all are trying to get free, then sister, come on, let's get there. But if it's about being careless it's about, oh, well, you don't have a period or you can't have no baby. I don't understand why womanhood has to be entrenched in pain. Oh. Because having babies is painful. Why would you want someone else to have, necessarily have to deal with that pain? Yes, the joy that comes from it. Also, women talk about, well, you don't have a cycle. Well, from my understanding, those things are painful and you be talking about how it hurts you. So why would you want me to go through that pain? Right. So it's like just to have those conversations that womanhood should not be entrenched in pain. That there mm. is a youth that lies with all of us who, you know, define our own womanhood. And that's how I, you know, choose to approach the situation that I'm not in competition with anyone. Yeah. Woo. I love it, Octavia. You know, this um, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the pandemic, you know, and how it has affected everything. Um, how do you think, Kaneen, uh, from a care standpoint, the pandemic affected um, 
this community right here that we're speaking about. Okay. Well, I wanted to just address that question really okay. briefly. You asked two of them and I didn't get to sure. say it. Sure. Yes. So, come on. so um, for the first thing I want to do, <clears throat> just piggyback a little bit off of what Amaya said. And I feel like um, we shouldn't have to, you know, open the textbooks and give 101, you know, <clears throat> just because our narrative is not as um it is not as public or it is not as normalized as everyone else's like um but i do think that when we are willing to traumatize ourselves and make ourselves vulnerable and share people should listen and uh i've been in spaces and places jobs where i had to walk away from positions because I was being silenced when my voice should have been the loudest. Right. We're, we're in rooms and I'm the only trans person in the room who is black, who's been homeless, who is living through um, this, this HIV thing, the nothingness. I'm the only one who's living through it. And I'm the only one who can talk. I'm the only one who's been, because a lot of times when we come into places, we're given entry level positions. And so, and we have to, we, it's, it's, it's something that we have to stop doing in the community. I like what Octavia said about all of us, all three of us proving that tr being trans is not a monolith. We all come from different spheres. And so we know how to respect each other in those different lanes. And I think that um, our healthcare system should reflect that. It should be made up of people who come from different spheres, the councils, the boards, the panels, the policies, all of this should be crafted by people who come from different lanes because you're representing a society that's diverse. You're not representing all um, academics. You're not representing all people who are in a certain lane or in a certain sphere financially. You're not representing all poor people, but you're representing a culmination of all of those things. And so we don't just give us a $200 incentive or a $50 incentive and take the most broken and traumatized of us who are not even at the capacity to come in mm -hmm. and really give you that in-depth analysis that you need. They're just Ooh. there for that, that incentive. You don't want to, you, you know, a lot of times we want we don't want to it's it's I, I i like to use this reference remember the movie roscoe when martin lawrence moved away and started his life over even in dirty laundry they moved away they started over they were ashamed of their family right and and that's how it is with us a lot in this in this in this acronym because they keep changing so i'm not even gonna try to see it but a lot of times we're ashamed of each other we get this a lot from our gay brothers, ashamed. And so our voice, you don't want to hear the trauma that we've gained from being out there in that struggle. So you suppress that voice and that voice needs to be heard, but you don't want to hear it because you don't want to be convicted by that pain. That's right. You don't want to hear that. And so we have to stop silencing the voices of our traumatized. We have to stop silencing the voices of our oppressed and those who have struggled through things. And real briefly, I want to jump on what Octavia said. My relationship, um, Black women are my most major supporters. I love them. I adore them. Um, everything that, <laughs> it's been some rough times in my life, things I didn't understand. I was able to go to them. My grandmother is my greatest inspiration, my biological mother, my sisters. I am them. I say, I call this whole journey the path of my foremothers. Mm -hmm. And so when I do things, I think about my nieces. I think about my siblings. I don't give into a lot of stuff because I think about how it's going to affect my nieces. I think about how it's going to affect those who are coming behind me. But I will also say this, just because I was not born without a womb, it does not a physical womb because I give birth spiritually every day. Just because I was not born without a physical womb, it does not mean that I am not a mirror of the divine feminine. I am not the Robin to your Batman. I am not your sidekick. 
And so when we know that and when we and when we can walk in that, then that's the only thing that I don't like is sometimes there's this and it hasn't happened to me in a long time because I know how to communicate. But I think that is the the animosity that exists between a lot of um, trans women and, and bio or cis women. That conversation has not been had and it's not been articulated that, hey, I am a reflection of the goddess, too. I am a reflection of the divine feminine, too. I am whole. I came from egg and seed. I came from a mother and a father. And if I choose to go this way or I choose to go that way or I choose to go in between, that is my genetic right. That's my genetic birthright. And, and as far and as far as and as far as the and as far as the pandemic, I would say how it's affected the community. So I have lived when the pandemic started, I was in Africa, South Africa for nine months. I got stuck there. And so um, I was watching it happen from there. I think that the pandemic has had its ups and downs. But I think that I am really actually kind of like in a beautiful space with the community because I have seen so many of us, like I tried to step away from the community. I got frustrated. And my, my, my trans people, they really have gathered around me. Not, not some of them I had to distance myself from, but the ones that I never would have thought, they stepped up. And so seeing us now coming together to make sure that we have the economic support and the stability and just being there for each other. Like I've seen so much um, in the trans community, so much of us coming together and to reason and to try to make things better for our trans siblings. And so I think we're doing a great job of honoring our trans ancestors and our ancestors all together. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes, and yes. Dr. Manning, this is a, we're, these are going to go into our final thoughts now. So if you want to touch on the pandemic and give me your final thoughts um, for today. Yeah, so I, I just agree with everyone saying here. I think the pandemic brought about a special set of challenges on its own with so many different healthcare topics um, for so many different populations, Blacks, trans, like everybody was affected in some type of way by the pandemic, but I think our marginalized and most vulnerable populations were affected the most because access has been, was always, okay, let me be clear, access to healthcare was always an issue, <laughs> okay, and then when the pandemic came, it became more of an issue, getting people connected into the services and the resources that they need. I will say that I think, I mean, I have mixed feelings about telemedicine, if I'm being honest. Mm. I won't really get into that here because of those mixed feelings, but I think on some fronts, it helped you be more like to be in spaces like now, like you can be in a space, you can set up an appointment with your physician, how effective that space is or in like how the follow-up care is, those things were already very challenging without the pandemic. And I think it just became even more challenging. And so you're seeing, um, I'm seeing lots of patients with depression, lack of physical activity. So, you know, it, it's it's not just about mental health issues that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, physical issues, things that affect your cardiovascular system, lack of activity, not exercising, people not eating right. So I, and then you, intimate partner violence. Okay, I think someone brought that up earlier. That has been an issue during the pandemic, people staying at home, more intimate partner violence. Um, and then, you know, and, you know, physicians don't always necessarily screen for these things, you know, during visits. So I think that has so many things have exacerbated because of the pandemic. But I do think um, that telemedicine has provided one avenue for us to reach folks, but we are still so very, very far from where we need to be in terms of bridging the gap um, with and without a pandemic, basically. So my overall final thoughts are everyone can be an advocate. You can advocate with family, friends, colleagues. You just keep educating, um, educating others, educating yourself, okay? Um, we have a long way to go 
in trans health and and reaching the trans community because like someone stated earlier, we haven't even gotten the black white thing, right? Oh, right. We're still having <laughs> issues. You know, we have so many isms in this country and that we're just like nowhere close to even getting things that have been going on for over 400 years together. And so we are so, so far from where we need to be in terms of being advocates and reaching out to the community and providing the best health care possible. And that's very sad for me to say, especially being a physician. Um, and I just think we need more people in this country who are willing to just see see people, love people, <laughs> um, um, and willing to, to work. Like this takes work to work for change. It can't always just be, oh, I hope they do well. And I, I don't wish any harm against anybody or I'm not racist or I'm not transphobic or whatever. Forget these statements, let's work, like let's act <laughs> to make change. Thank you. Octavia, what do you got? Well, I'm just gonna leave, you know, um, with the words that my mentor always instilled in me. Um, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. Mm. Drop, look, Octavia said drops mic. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally. Amaya, Amaya, talk to me. Yes. Um, Yo, I'm sorry, I'm still thinking about what Octavia said. That was, yes. so, I think that I was processing um, that. What are we speaking on? Oh, sure, just your final thoughts for today. Yeah. Um, I just love the conversation. Like, I love that we were able to speak so freely. I love that, um, that you're giving us a voice to, oh, well, not a voice, but a platform to share our voices. I love that we're many different sisters from many walks of life. Um, I love that we took the time to be transparent and to have these conversations. I think because I don't know if I commented on that, but as far as just to run back to the cisgendered women in France, we have a lot more in common than we have differences. And I yes. think that's I'm a huge um, factor, you know? We, I'm a woman. And I mean, period. <laughs> um, it's no competition. It's no fighting. I just wish that we can see that we again have much more in common than we have um, different. Thank you, Kaneen. Final thoughts. Um, my final thoughts would be: um, first of all, um, I want to um, thank. Um, what is it? Black women's. Health imperative, yeah. Yeah, Black Women's Health Imperative for creating this platform, um, allowing me to share space with such brilliant, beautiful, deeply melanated beings. Um, also, just um, to just for us to continue these conversations. I think that um, everything, you know, everything starts with a conversation. We don't realize how powerful. Com our conversations are, you know, um, this is art, you know, what we all are giving here, this is art and art shapes life. You know, that's why when people say, oh, it was just a movie or, oh, it was just a song. No, this stuff inspires us. It empowers us. It motivates us. It gives us purpose and reason, you know, so everything when we, when we share a space and we you know, take the time to have these types of conversations. We're inspiring our the people who are watching right now, you know, to to make different choices and perhaps better choices. So my my closing thoughts would be just to keep the conversation going. Don't lose the momentum. Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you to you all. I did want to mention, we did have a comment earlier from Gianna, thank you, who is an ally and said she would be interested in speaking with um, anyone who would like to discuss her medical software team and how they can avoid building bias into their system. Um, so anybody who wants to drop into the comments later to give contact information to Gianna, that would be wonderful there. We um, have a lot of allies with BWHI. This whole program was sponsored by one of our programs on our own terms. Um, you can go to uh, the, the sub website um, there. Um, it's uh, on our own terms, uh, OOOT. 
www.bwhi.org. And we actually have a very robust HIV prevention training guide. You can download it. It's a free resource on that site as well. So please take advantage of these many resources that the Black Women's Health Imperative has. And we look forward to doing this sort of programming again really soon. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.